when the process gets trapped in match like either uh, 0 or 1. And so these stationary states are all of the form. So they have an entry 1 minus pi of the first uh, state, 0 and pi of the last state. Okay. Um, and this you can sort of see, I mean, if you, if you take here a vector um, which has uh, some entry in the first row and some entry in the last row, and you multiply it with this matrix, you will see that, that it will just be reproduced because of, because of these things here. Okay, okay so, so that's sort of what we, more or less, what we discussed last time. Now, on the other hand, we, we were also looking at the calculation of the um, of the uh, fixation probability. And uh, um, that looks sort of similar, but not quite. Okay. So. So if you remember, we were looking at the fixation probability. So. Um, So this was called pi n. So this is a probability that the process starts at state n and that it gets ultimately uh, fixated at capital N. Okay. Um, and the, the recursion relation that we use to, to uh, derive this uh, looks like this. Um, so uh, in, in general, so basically what you know what I what I sort of argued to calculate uh, the succession probability was to say okay um, we're, we're looking assume the process the, the, the process makes one step and then we ask what is the fixation probability from that one step okay so this convergent uh, relation uh, in the end looks like this so you know either the, the process goes to uh, n plus 1 and fixes from there, or it goes to n minus 1 and fixes from there, or it stays where it is. Right, so that was a recursion relation that we solved. And now you see that this sort of looks similar to this thing, except that the, 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 the uh, transition matrix elements that appear here are slightly different. And in fact, what, what appears here is the transpose of the matrix, right? So rather than, I mean, this is actually the same term as that, and this is the same term as that, but you see that rather than T n n minus 1, you have T n minus 1 n, okay? So this is, of course, also a kind of eigenvalue problem, but it's an eigenvalue problem for the transpose matrix, okay? So, so this you can write, obviously, you can say that this is the same as saying that um, T hat, so we call this the transpose, right? Transpose matrix um, multiplied with the vector pi is equal to is equal to pi. Right? So the the um, fixation probability is is also um, an eigenvector, but it's an eigenvector of the other of the of the transpose matrix. So fixation probability. Um, 
then you see that, that this is the probability of going from n to n plus 1, this is the probability of going from n to n minus 1, this is probability of going from n to n, and the sum of those probabilities has to sum to 1, because the process has to go somewhere. So just by, by, um, by uh, conservation of probability, uh, this eigenvalue problem uh, always has a solution of a constant vector, but this is of course not the one that we want. So, what we, so the fixation probability is a kind of non-trivial solution of this eigenvalue problem, which has a property that it has to be 0 at 0 and it has to be 1 at, at capital N, because we have these boundary conditions, right? Because we said if we start at 0, then the fixation probability, the probability to fix at capital N is 0, if we start at n, it has to be equal to 1. So we have to supplement this linear problem with, an I, with, a, with a boundary condition. So this problem has, um, so this has a kind of a trivial solution. Which is just uh, pi n equal to 1. Um, but the fixation probability is uh, the non trivial solution because it also has to satisfy um, to satisfy the boundary condition. So this is now the so-called diffusion uh, theory, which, which uh, largely, I guess, goes back to Kimura. Um, and we're again going to, to do um, Start from the Moran process uh, with uh, no selection. Okay, so we have again two types. One process no selection. And then we have the master equation, which I just wrote down for you, but, but now I'm going to, uh, so now I'm sort of going to do. 
um, the, the, the slight modification that I'm at least going to do uh, to, to work in continuous time. Okay, so let's let's uh, uh, assume that we take a continuum limit um, and the motivation for this is that in one time step the population changes by one, but if the population size is very large, this is a small a small um, uh, time step. So this doesn't really you know, that this doesn't really require uh, much uh, arguing. So we want to write down the master, the master equation for this process in continuous time. And this then looks like this. So this is now um, so the probabilities, so what we're going to look at is the probability P of n t, which is a probability to have uh, n a individuals at time t. Okay. N equal to n a. And then I get what, what I just uh, wrote down with a small modification. So we have here, again, the various contributions. Um, but now I just have, because I've sort of subtracted um, the, um, I have to subtract the probability of staying in the same place, which I can just write like the sum of the two probabilities of going to n minus one or n.
Um, so this is, you know, this is a little calculation that you can just do. I mean, it's, it's basically all about the n plus ones and the n minus ones which don't precisely cancel. And if you figure out what, what remains, then it's precisely this equation here. Um, and now we want to, uh, you know, we want to introduce an appropriate time scale. And therefore, you know, we want to sort of transform away this one over n squared factor. And then for historical reasons, one also introduces a factor of two. So we introduce a time scale now, um, which I call tau, which is uh, 2t over n squared. And this is the time scale that I've already discussed on Friday. So this is sort of the, the this is t divided by the characteristic a time scale in the Moran model on which, for example, an heterozygosity decays. And so if you introduce this time scale, then you get uh, this equation here, now in rescale time, and then you get a factor of one half in front, and uh, the end dependence has not vanished. Okay. And this is what is typically called, or this is a, the, the particular case of the Kimura equation. Uh, without selection and mutation. So we'll, we'll put in selection and mutations in a moment. Now the nice thing about this equation is that if you do the same procedure for the white fisher model, which has more complicated, much more complicated uh, transition matrices, uh, in this limit you get the same thing. Right? So for the white fisher model, um, We get the same equation. The only thing that is different is the time scale. So the time scale is not n squared, but it's n, and the factor of 2 is missing. So the time scale of the right position model is just 2 over n. But apart from that, this is the same thing. So this is sort of, uh, I think, one reason why, why people like to, to work with these equations because they are very, you know, they're sort of fairly universal. It's very similar to, I mean, mathematically very similar to, to the fact that uh, a large class of random walk processes lead to, lead to a diffusion equation, and the only thing that sort of survives of, of the random walk is the, 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 the drift and the variance, and similar to here, the only thing that really survives if you have this, this very simple case of mm -hmm. uh, no Where does the one over n squared factor come from? Well, it's, it's sort of, um, so, so there's a kind of trivial part. The trivial part is that in the Moran model, in each time step, you only change one individual, right? So in order to, to, to update the entire population, you need n time steps. That's sort of the first part. The other part is a sort of intrinsic one over n, which is, uh, comes from the fact that all that is, because we don't have mutations or selections here, selection here, all that really happens is due to the random sampling. And so the, if you will, this is a noise strength. I mean, there's a kind of, right, there, there's, a, there's, a, um, there's a random sampling noise, and this noise has, has strength 1 over n. So it disappears, of course, when n goes to infinity, then there's no sampling noise anymore, and therefore this term is, 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 would, would be absent, right? Um, because there's no selection, there's no mutation, so if, if you didn't have this, this uh, sampling uh, process, then that nothing will change. The only thing that changes is because of this random sampling. And this, I think, you could see, you know, you could see that best maybe in the in this uh, decay of the heterozygosity that I explained last Friday. That if you just ask for the probability of two individuals being of the same type, then this will decay on the time scale, which is exactly this n squared time scale here. Okay, so that's where it comes from. Um, but of course, what, what sort of makes this mathematically quite interesting is this, this x times 1 minus x factor here, which tells you that this process, so essentially this, you know, this diffusion process is what, what population genetics is called a genetic drift, and it's a diffusion process, but you see that it has this feature that it becomes very slow when x is close to 0 or when x is close to 1. So you have a kind of diffusion process on the interval, which, which um, is, is, gets very slow in the boundaries and which actually gets stuck if it reaches the boundaries. So, so there, this, this problem of fixation is still inherent in this, in this equation. We'll see that in a moment. That this equation still sort of knows about the fact that fixation can occur. 
Okay, so this is the, uh, the key thing. So maybe I'll just leave it uh, down here for a moment. Um, And so you see, this is this has the form of a kind of of a Fokker Planck equation, if you will, but with a kind of uh, interesting looking diffusion term. So the first thing, so let you know, let's let's look at some properties of this equation. Um, so let me just put a kind of equation here. So properties. Um, I guess you know about Fokker Planck equations, right? Do you? So, okay, so this is an example of a Fokker Planck equation. <laughs> so, Fokker Planck equation, I mean, you know, we'll see, we'll see a slightly more general form um, uh, later. It's also sometimes called a forward polynomial equation. This is just something that appears uh, in, in generally stochastic processes. Um, it, it conserves probability, of course, so this is obviously important. And so this means you can write it as a kind of continuity equation, right? So we can write this as, as minus some current uh, in j by dx, where j is a kind of probability current. That you, that you typically do when you see a Fokker Planck equation like this is that you try to find its stationary solution. Right? So, so, how would you find the stationary solution of this equation? Would this equal to zero? Right, you put the current equal to zero. Right? So, what is the stationary solution? Which means that the thing on in, is behind the, the, the derivative should be a constant, right? So x times 1 minus x times p should be a constant, which I can call c. And so p, so if this is supposed to be a stationary solution, then this has to be a constant divided by x times 1 minus x, right? So this is what, what a stationary solution of this equation would look like. And this is but this is defined on the interval 0, 1, right? So x lives on the interval 0, 1. And you see that this diverges at the boundaries of that interval and it's not normalizable. So that tells you that this equation doesn't have a stationary solution that is somehow regular, right? So there's no, so this is not normalizable. And, and this is, of course, in some sense what we expect because we know that the process, at least the process that we started from the, on the, in the discrete setting, always gets stuck at zero or at one. So, so the stationary solution, the, 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 the true stationary solutions are sort of delta functions. Right? So because of fixation, so this, this again shows you that fixation occurs. So because of fixation, stationary solution solutions um, are of the form so this p star of x would be similar to what we had before. It would be a combination of a delta function at zero Right. 
so this this is what the what the two uh, stationary solutions uh, look like. Um, one can, in fact, and this was done fairly recently by Alan McCain and David Moxman, you, you can sort of find um, you, you can find an exact time dependent solution of this equation, which is of this form with, with sort of time dependent pi's plus a smooth part. So basically, you know, if you think about Suppose you wanted to put this equation on a, on a computer, you start with something smooth, right? You start, for example, with some um, nice looking uh, distribution. So you're between 0 and 1. And you know, you start with something like this, and you let it evolve. And then what will happen is that the part in the middle will become smaller, and you will have sort of delta peaks growing up at the boundaries, and at long enough times everything will be at the boundaries. So, so this is so the stationary solution will be on this form, where this pi, of course, depends on the initial condition. So there's a kind of continuum of these of these singular uh, stationary solutions. Okay. And so what we now want to do is actually calculate this, um, uh, this fixation probability within this framework. So we'll see that this actually is quite simple. But, but of course, it's sort of, to make this interesting, we actually want to do this for, uh, for the case with selection. So we need to um, include the case of selection also. So let me show you how that works. So now we have um, a kind of fitness difference between the A and B types, right? Now, in order to include this deterministic part, 
is to write a first order derivative of this form um, into the equation. Right? So this is sort of how we would. So this is, I mean, there's a, um, this is of course a massive source of confusion that physicists call this a drift term.
Um, and if we do that, then we can sort of pull out a factor of, of n over 2 from both terms. And, and rescale, you know, use the, the rescale time that I introduced before. And then we get here an equation which now contains selection and uh, uh, check if this has a stationary solution. Um, and we'll see that it doesn't. And of course it, it shouldn't because even with selection the process still, still tends to get um, stuck at the boundaries. So again we would have to um, so, so here, it's, it's sort of to, to do that, uh, it's useful to, to look at this thing here and to define this as a kind of new function. So let me call this q of x, q of x of t, or q of x. Um, so we're just looking, we're looking for a stationary solution. Um, and the stationary solution, again, should have the... Um, uh, probability current being equal to zero. Um, so the probability current is what, what is sort of to the left of this derivative, so this is equal to S silver times Q um, minus plus uh, minus one half Q by dx. Zero, right? And um, this you can easily solve. So q of x is an exponential function is some constant times e to the two s tilde times x. And so p is um, constant times e to the two s tilde times x divided by x times one minus x. So it still diverges at the boundaries and is still not normalizable. Okay, so, so that's what, and that, that is of course what we what we expect in order to get a normalizable solution, we actually need to add mutations, uh, which we can also do. With but maybe this would be a good time to take a short break. So formally, we can obviously we can write it as um, a, a linear operator acting on p, right? So this is a linear operator here, which is um, what is on the, on the right hand side, right?
Okay, so this is the kind of sort of actual function. And, and, what, and, and what, I, what I just argued was that this thing doesn't have any uh, non signal stationary solutions, so the stationary solutions are sitting at the boundary, and we want to calculate the fixation probability. Right? So, what is the fixation probability? Um, and and uh, so here I will, I will refer to what I uh, said in the beginning, namely that um, in order to, to obtain the fixation probability, we should look for um, a, um, an, an eigenfunction of the adjoint of this operator L. Right? So this is sort of what we, what we did for the Moran model. So recall the situation for the Moran model. Um, so the fixation probability is something like a stationary eigenvector of the, the joint time evolution operator with appropriate boundary conditions. So this is what I what I discussed in the beginning. Um, and so, um, uh, so, so here we can do the same thing. So the first thing that we need to know, what is the adjoint of this operator L? And this is you know, something that you, that you probably uh, remember from quantum mechanics. Now, of course, in quantum mechanics, the operators are always self-adjoint, so one doesn't really have to worry about their adjoint uh, um, uh, operator. But essentially, what the adjoint, the, the adjoint means, as in quantum mechanics, that you want to sort of push the action of this operator. So if you look at the, at the, the, the scalar product between two functions, you want to push the action of the operator from one function to the other, which essentially means that you have to do a kind of uh, partial integration. Right? So in this case, and so this, so this means that you can basically, so for example, this operator would be self-adjoint, right? But because it has a C in uh, this uh, uh, x-dependent function, um, if you if you uh, want to um, do a, do a partial integration, this function will will go to the other side. Right, so so the self, the adjoint of this operator has the x times one minus x on the other side, and similarly this one, except that here there's also a sign change uh, because it's the first order operator. Okay, so the, the um, so here the adjoint operator is simply here, um, and this is in stochastic processes in, in stochastic process theory. This is also called then the backwards. Kolmogorov equation. So if, if, if this is the forward Kolmogorov equation, then this is the backwards Kolmogorov equation. Um, so this will correspond to the backwards um, Kolmogorov equation. Uh, so the adjoint of L is, um, let me call it L star. And so this just has um, the, um, uh, uh, as I said, we have to turn, um, we have to put the x times one minus x on the other side, and we have a sign change for the um, for the first order term, uh, but not for the second order term. So this will be the adjoint of, of L, okay? And you can see that, again, very similar to, to uh, what, what I discussed in the discrete case, uh, this thing, of course, has a trivial eigenfunctions, namely the constants, right? So any constant that you put in front of this will, will, go to, will, will have zero. So this has, um, so constants are trivial. with eigenvalue zero. Um, and also, this is no longer a, a, a 
this doesn't conserve probability. I mean, this is this of course conserves probability. Right? This we can write as the divergence of the current, but this does not conserve probability. But this again the same thing as in the in the discrete case where you, the, the transpose of the matrix is no longer conserving probability because the sums over rows are one, but not the sums over columns. Okay, so this does not conserve. So now the, the fixation probability will be an eigenfunction of this thing uh, with eigenvalue zero, but with the correct boundary conditions. So the fixation probability and this we call now pi of x, so this is just the probability of, uh, of the, the fixing to x equal to 1, so the probability for the process to get caught at x equal to 1, provided it starts at x. <coughs> and so this is an eigen, so this should satisfy, um, satisfies L star of pi equal to 0, with the boundary conditions that pi of 0 is equal to 0, and pi of 1 So that's what we have to solve. Okay. Um, so as we apply this to pi, so the equation that we need to solve is the following. So we have x times 1 minus x, which is a kind of common um, factor. And then we have s tilde plus
So the 2s obviously cancels, and so in the end, the fixation probability is 1 minus e to the minus 2s tilde times x divided by 1 minus e to the minus 2s tilde. So this is the solution. Um, and uh, now we can we can compare this um, to the uh, to the result that we obtained for the directive for the Moron process. So if we did everything correctly, uh, this should agree, right? Because we solved the discrete model um, exactly. So for the uh, if you re remember for the for the Moron model, the formula that we got was the following. So pi n was equal to one minus one plus s to the minus n divided by one minus one plus s to the minus capital N. Um, but now we have to, of course, you know, recall what this s tilde is. So s tilde in, is implicitly depends on n. So s tilde um, is equal to um, n over 2 times s, or s is equal to 2 over n times s tilde. And so if we introduce that here, then you see, and of course, so, so s becomes, you know, if I keep s tilde fixed, and I take n to infinity, then s becomes very small. So this will essentially, so this, this factor here will effectively become an exponential. So this will be 1 minus e to the minus s n divided by 1 minus e to the minus s capital N. And if we now introduce uh, the, the, the definition of n tilde, then you see that we get exactly what we want. So this will become so s times small n will become 2 times s tilde times x, right? And downstairs we also have e to the minus 2 s tilde. So this is okay, right? So this, this comes out correctly. So the, the continuum limit um, that we did on the level of the equation um, also works out uh, for the fixation probability. Um, but what is sort of more important, and this is the way this is usually presented in the literature, is that this, of course, also gives you an expression for the fixation probability uh, for other models, which, which you cannot solve explicitly. And in particular, for the right Fisher model, um, if we put in uh, this expression for the selection coefficient, then for the right Fisher model, um, you would get uh, uh, you would get the same thing, right? For the right Fisher model, um, you need a slightly different um, uh, rescaling. Yeah, the only thing is that the factor of two is missing. So for the right Fisher model, um, the factor of two will not be there. So for the right Fisher model, S tilde is equal to n times s, and then you have here the fixation probability one minus e to the minus um, two and okay n is equal to x is equal to so capital n. Um, so you get this formula. Uh, which is usually presented in the literature as the fixation probability for the right Fisher model. Okay. Well, this was derived by Kimura in 1962. But I think it's sort of, I'd like to emphasize that this is not an, 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 an exact result or an explicit result for the, for the right Fisher model, but it's obtained via this diffusion approximation. So it's, it's true, I think, as, as you can see sort of from this comparison, it is true in the limit um, population size to infinity selection coefficient to zero in such a way that the product n times s uh, remains constant. Okay. But for, for finite n and finite s, it's only an approximation. Okay. Um, and I think the different 
limit of this expression we discussed already on uh, Friday. So for when S is negative, this becomes exponentially small in the population size. So the fixation of mutations that lower the fitness is very unlikely. And uh, when, when S is positive, then you can basically inject this term and uh, the, the expression becomes this, which just depends on small n times S. And will be essentially one when small n times S is the function. Okay, are there any questions about this? So I hope the mathematics is clear enough. Okay, so maybe the, the last point that I want to want to then discuss today is the, the effect of mutations. I think it is quite interesting because it gives you, first of all, this changes the, the structure of the equations qualitatively in the sense that we then have a stationary solution. And uh, these stationary solutions also have some interesting uh, structure. So, But I, so, so for this discussion, I want to include mutations, but not selections. So I don't want to consider everything at the same time. Uh, so uh, no selection, because otherwise it becomes a little bit messy. Um, and I just you know, remember from what we did in the first lecture, we have uh, mutations between these types. Uh, a and B, and so we mutate from A to B at rate U and uh, from B to A at rate V, for example. Um, and on the deterministic level, um, we know in principle um, how this uh, uh, how this should appear. And again, there is a factor of n that comes in because of this uh, Mohr model. So, so on the deterministic level, the frequency would just change you know, at rate 1 over n. And then we would have um, basically the v. So, um, So we, we would create um, the, um, let's see, this is not for another thing that I should, okay, no problem, let's rewrite. So, so basically we have at rate V, we're creating the X type uh, from the, uh, the A type from the B type, and at, at rate U we're losing uh, the X type, right? So this would be the, the dynamics. Um, right, um, and, uh, and this we now have to put into, again, into the uh, fokker planck equation, so in the usual way. So we just have to add the corresponding term to the um, diffusion equation. Um, and if we do that, okay, maybe I'll, I'll do it uh, uh, slowly. So, so first of all, we have this thing here, right? Um, which will be uh, 1 over n term times v times n minus x minus u times x times p, and here we have the 1 over n squared term um, the second derivative. And so we have again the same problem that we have with selection, that this mutation term is formally of order 1 over n, whereas the um, genetic drift term is of order n squared. So again, in order to have a well-defined limit, we need to rescale the mutation rates. And again, 
again, we introduce a factor of one half for sort of historical reasons. So these rescale mutation rates are uh, u times n and uh, v times n. And then we can go again go to the, the rescale coordinates, to the rescale time scale, and then we get um, this equation here, which now has a v tilde times 1 minus x minus a u tilde times x. So this is now the, the diffusion equation including mutations. And again, the question that we want to ask is whether there is a stationary solution. Right. Um, Again, it will be useful to consider this combination here as a new function q of x. Um, and so this function q of x, so if I write the probability current in terms of this function q of x, then the probability current will be, um, will be um, uh, v tilde divided by, let's see, so this is x. So here we are only have a, we have a 1 minus x, so we need to, to compensate for that. Okay, let me write it maybe in a different way. So we have the, the probability thing that comes from the mutation, which is this. But here is a p and not a q, so we have to divide by x times 1 minus x. Right, so this is the mutation part, and then we have the diffusion part, which is um, so this is multiplied by q minus one half q by the x. Right, so this is the probability current. So yeah, I just put the p by replace the p by q divided by x times one minus x. Um, um, and so this is supposed to be equal to zero. Right? If I have a stationary solution. This is supposed to be equal to zero, so we can write this as a differential equation for the logarithm of q. So 1 over q times the q by the x. So this would be equal to um, two times this function here. Okay, so this is the, the differential equation for log q that we want to solve. So it's not very difficult, so we have 1 over x, and we have 1 over 1 minus x. So um, if we just integrate this, then and we could put the two factor of 2 on the other side. So we have, um, we just need to, to um, uh, 
integrate on both sides, and we get here log q, and here we get log x, and here we get log 1 minus x, right? So essentially, uh, log q of x, and we introduce some arbitrary reference at point x0, uh, this will be equal to v tilde times log of x over x0, um, and plus, because of the, you know, we integrate this because of the minus sign here, we get actually get a plus against times u tilde times log 1 minus x over 1 minus x0. Just maybe I guess it's ln of qx over qx0. Ah, uh, yes, I'm sorry. Yeah, sure. Right, so this log of qx. And all these q of x zeros and x zeros and, and so on give rise to um, to um, uh, some some integration constant. So if we now exponentiate this on both sides, uh, then uh, and we put, can put the two back uh, back here. It doesn't really matter. So we put the two here. We exponentiate it, and what this then means is that q of x will be some constant times x divided by x0 to the power two v tilde times 1 minus x divided by 1 minus x0 to, to the power 2 u tilde. Um, and, and now we recall that q is equal to, so q was equal to uh, x times 1 minus x times p, so we need another factor. So all of this is, of course, these are just constants. The essential thing is that this is x to the 2 v tilde times 1 minus x to the 2 u tilde. And so p of x, the stationary solution, which is 1 over x times 1 minus x times p of x, is some other constant, which we can fix later by normalization, times x to the 2 v tilde minus 1 times 1 minus x to the 2 u tilde minus 1. All right, so this is sort of the essential point. So, so what you can sort of mathematically, and so without mutations, we had 1 over x times 1 minus x, right? And what you see is, is that the mutations, what the mutations do is to make these, uh, the, the, the powers of x and 1 minus x a little bit larger, and they make them just larger enough so that this is now a normalizable density, right? So this is now, this can of course still have a divergence, so if v tilde is less than 1 half, then this will still be divergent at x equal to 0, uh, or at, at x equal to 1, but it will no longer be uh, non-integrable. Okay, so this, so the mutations have sort of removed, um, have removed uh, the non-integrable divergences So this is now a good stationary distribution. Again, this is you know this shouldn't come as, as that much of a surprise because we know from the, the analysis already of the deterministic equations actually that, that, that if, if there are mutations so if you're able to sort of create A types from B types or and B types from A types, then obviously you know none of the two species can ever go entirely extinct, right? I mean you, you, you'll be able to always uh, uh, recreate them, so you, you will have a stationary state at a finite frequency, but this shows a sort of nice mathematical mechanism by which this works. Moreover, it tells you that there's a kind of qualitative difference, so, so things sort of depend on the size of these scaled mutation rates, and we recall that these mutation rates are, um, are again scaled with n, right? And again, this sort of makes biological sense because mutation rates 
in reality are very small, you know, 10 to the minus 6, 10 to the minus 8, whatever, and so u times n is often a number of order unity. And, and so, so what you can see, so let's, let's suppose for simplicity that u tilde and v tilde are the same, so we have a symmetric mutation scheme. Um, and then you see that there are sort of two qualitatively different behaviors, what these functions look like. So if we do look at this distribution now, so this is now a stationary distribution. Um, if, if, uh, the mutation, if the scale mutation rate is, um, is, um, uh, is, is uh, uh, smaller um, than one half, which actually means, so, so v tilde equal to one half means that v times n is equal to one, all right? So if, uh, if uh, the mutation rates are, if the scale mutation rate is smaller than one, then you have divergences at the boundaries, and so then your stationary solution will look something like this, all right? So this means that um, the most likely, uh, so if you look at you know, if you look at the sample of the process, so the you know the A and the B pro, the, the A and the B types are are um, sort of fluctuating in the population, then the most probable state will be a state either very close to zero or close to one. Right? So you have a lot of probability here. Whereas if you go to um, larger mutation rates, then at some point these exponents will become positive and then the probability to be at the boundary actually goes to zero and you have something that looks like this. Right? So this would be when you find the exponents greater than one. So in this case, the mutation, so, so this tells you that in some sense um, uh, u times n equal to one is sort of the scale where the mutations really start to mix up the population and, uh, and, and you don't see any, any uh, strong effect of, of uh, fixation at the two boundaries anymore. So, um, this is uh, what, what, what comes out in this case. Okay. And now, of course, you could, you, know, you could think about what happens if you add uh, selection to this, and, and, and we, we saw that already before. Essentially, what selection will do, so if you have a positive selection coefficient, then this will sort of bias, this will put on a bias and, 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 and tend to push the distribution for, if S is positive, it will tend to push the distribution towards one, if S is negative, it pushes it towards zero, but there will still be a stationary solution. Okay. Um, are there any questions about this? Is it a bit clear? Um, okay, I think I'll just actually, I think that we, can, we can then maybe stop here, right? And then, so what I, what I plan to do, I had a sort of a, a section about branching processes, but I think this is, it wouldn't make much sense to start that today, and I don't think we really need it, so I, I think I'll just uh, skip that. And, and so on Wednesday, um, <clears throat> what I want to discuss on Wednesday um, is the so-called coalescent theory. So this is, uh, as I mentioned in the introduction, uh, we'll be looking at these processes sort of backwards in time. So we're looking at the genealogies that these processes are creating. And they can, and, and so there's something called the Kingman coalescent, which in some sense is the backwards um, equivalent of this diffusion theory. And, and there are some tree shapes that one can look at. And so that will be the topic in the next day. Okay. Thank you.